The following lecture is brought to you by the Boot Camp Subcommittee of the Committee on Resident Education of the Society of Neurological Surgeons. When starting your training, it is important to remember that despite the advancements in imaging technology, history and physical makes the diagnosis 90% of the time. Thus, clinical examination remains an essential skill. The neurological exam is composed of six parts, mental status, language, cranial nerves, motor, sensory, and reflexes. Mental status testing requires assessment of level of consciousness, orientation, attention span, mood and affect, as well as disorders of thinking and perception. Cognitive function testing requires assessment of common knowledge and memory, both short and long term. Abnormal language can be described by types of aphasia. Wernicke's, which is fluent. Broca's, which is non-fluent or expressive. Conduction, which is a problem with repetition. And transcortical. Here is a chart listing how verbal output, comprehension, and repetition are affected in the different aphasias. The key points to remember are that Wernicke is a problem with understanding, Broca is a problem with speech output, conduction is a problem with repetition, and transcortical aphasias are problems with understanding or speech output, yet with intact repetition. Cranial nerve 1 is the olfactory nerve. Indications for carrying out a test on this nerve include frontal headaches and seizures, which might be due to an olfactory groove meningioma. Smell is tested by using a non-noxious stimulus, such as soap or coffee, testing each nostril individually. Cranial nerve 2 is the optic nerve. It can be tested by visual acuity, visual fields, and pupillary reaction to light. It is also important to check for an afferent pupillary defect by using the swinging flashlight test. Cranial nerves 3, 4, and 6, the oculomotor, trochlear, and abducens nerves, control pupillary constriction and dilatation, eye movements, and eyelid elevation. Dysfunction of one or more of these functions produces pupillary inequality or anisocoria, diplopia, or ptosis. The extraocular muscles work together during the act of conjugate gaze and convergence, which are evaluated during the examination of these cranial nerves. Pupils should be examined for equality. If anisocoria exists, one must determine which pupil is abnormal. To test diplopia, the eye should be moved into the extremes of gaze in the six gaze directions that test individual muscles. To test ptosis, the patient should look up for one to two minutes. Ptosis due to myasthenia gravis usually worsens during prolonged upward gaze. The ptosis of Horner's syndrome is usually mild and associated with meiosis. Pupillary abnormalities can localize a lesion within the central nervous system. This is a diagram illustrating how to correlate pupillary findings with anatomic lesion location. Medriasis, or pupillary dilatation, may be due to several conditions. This table summarizes the causes by disorder. Meiosis, or pupillary constriction, may also be due to many conditions. This table summarizes the causes by disorder. Cranial nerve 5 contains both motor and sensory divisions, both of which should be tested. The presence of wasting of the temporalis muscle suggests involvement of the motor root. 
Jaw deviation upon opening the mouth may also be present. The masticatory muscles should be palpated when the patient attempts to clench their jaws. All three sensory divisions of the trigeminal nerve should be tested. The facial nerve supplies the muscles of facial expression and carries taste sensation from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. To test this nerve, have the patient smile vigorously to assess the strength of the muscles of the lower face, and then have the patient wrinkle their brow and squeeze their eyes tightly. Of note, the lacrimal and salivatory glands are also innervated by the parasympathetic fibers that are carried within the facial nerves. Cranial nerve 8 may be tested by rubbing fingers together and comparing a patient's ability to differentiate between right and left sides. Hearing loss can be detected with a tuning fork if it is severe. The doll's eye maneuver is performed by quickly moving the head from side to side and observing the movement of the globe within the orbit. Comatose patients with an intact midbrain and pons will have eyes that deviate opposite to the direction of head turning. Vestibular caloric testing is also useful in confirming the presence or absence of brainstem function in comatose patients. Cranial nerves 9 and 10 are usually tested together. It is convenient to think of cranial nerve 9 as mainly sensory and cranial nerve 10 as mainly motor. Testing sensation on the posterior third of the tongue and oropharynx is examined by testing the gag reflex. Hoarseness is characteristic of involvement of cranial nerve 10 and also occurs with lesions in the nucleus ambiguous. A unilateral lesion involving cranial nerve 10 reveals uvula deviation. Bilateral lesions of the descending cortical bulbar fibers can produce pseudobulbar palsy, in which case the palate elevates poorly to saying ah, but briskly when a gag reflex is elicited. The spinal accessory nerve supplies the ipsilateral sternocleidomastoid and trapezius muscles. Lesions manifest with weakness on head turning to the opposite side. Examination should include observation from muscle atrophy, palpation, and movement against resistance. Hemiparesis may be associated with weakness of shoulder shrug and weakness of turning the face towards the side of the hemiparesis. The hypoglossal nerve contains only fibers to the ipsilateral tongue. Damage to the hypoglossal nucleus or its fibers leads to tongue atrophy, weakness, and fasciculations. Also, the tongue protrudes to the side of the lesion. Motor function can be broken down by nerve root. Here is a table showing the nerve roots, their associated function, and innervated muscles. Muscle strength can be graded 0 to 5. 0 is total paralysis. 1 is trace contractions. 2 is movement in a plane without gravity. 3 is anti-gravity movement. 4 is anti-gravity plus some resistance. And 5 is full strength. Sensation is tested via dermatomes. Below is a diagram showing the dermatomal distribution. Here is another diagram showing the clinically relevant dermatomes for each nerve root. Deep tendon reflexes may be tested to localize lesions within the nervous system. Below is a chart showing each DTR, their localization, and their effect upon stimulation. Reflexes are graded from 0 to 4 plus. 0 is absent, 1 plus is sluggish, 2 plus is normal, 3 plus is hyperactive without clonus, 4 plus is hyperactive with clonus. In addition to DTRs, 
Clonus, Babinski, Hoffman, Bobo cavernosus, and the anal wink reflexes should be tested in specific patients. When testing for radiculopathy, it is important to relate root level with the distribution of sensory loss, motor weakness, and reflex loss. Below is a chart showing the various radiculopathies and their manifested symptoms. Incomplete spinal cord injuries may be categorized into different syndromes. Central cord syndrome occurs with cervical region injury and leads to greater weakness in the upper limbs than in the lower limbs with sacral sensory sparing. brown saccard syndrome occurs with spinal hemisection and leads to ipsilateral hemiplegia and loss of proprioceptive sensation with contralateral loss of pain and temperature. Anterior cord syndrome is typically vascular in nature and leads to a lesion causing variable loss of motor function and sensitivity to pain. Temperature is also involved. Proprioception, however, is preserved. Conus medullaris syndrome occurs after an injury to the terminal spinal cord, leading to early incontinence, perineal numbness, and preserved knee reflex. Cauda equina syndrome occurs after injury to the lumbosacral nerve roots in the spinal canal, leading to asymmetric lower limb weakness, leg pain, numbness, and absent reflexes. Delayed incontinence may occur in this case. Initial survey and assessment of a neurotrauma patient involves the standard ABCs, the Glasgow Coma Scale, pupillary function, and motor strength. The presence of hypotension in this patient population has been shown to double mortality. Hypoxia is another negative predictor of outcome and the combination of both hypotension and hypoxia has been shown to triple mortality. Thus, neurotrauma patients should be aggressively resuscitated upon presentation. Hypotension is rarely attributable to head injury, except in rare circumstances of terminal brain injury, infancy with loss of a large percentage of blood volume, and severe untreated scalp wounds. Neurogenic shock may occur with spinal cord injuries above T1 due to the interruption of sympathetics and the loss of vascular tone below the level of injury. In this setting, parasympathetics are unopposed and lead to bradycardia, lower vascular resistance, and venous pooling. The initial survey of a neurotrauma patient should be focused on evidence of injury to the head, spine, eyes, and tympanic membranes. Any signs of CSF leak should be noted. Inspection of the cranium should include surveying for evidence of basal or skull fractures, facial fractures, periorbital edema, and proptosis. Cranial cervical auscultation may reveal bruies and traumatic CC fistulas. Basal skull fractures may manifest with raccoon eyes, battle sign, CSF rhinorrhea or otorrhea, and hemotympanum or external auditory canal laceration. Never insert nasogastric tubes into a patient with a suspected basal or skull fracture. When determining if a fluid leak is in fact CSF, it is important to remember that CSF is always clear unless mixed with blood. Patients with rhinorrhea describe a salty or metallic taste. Collective fluid may be sent for quantitative glucose and beta-2 transferrin tests. The ring sign is a useful bedside test. The Glasgow Coma Scale is a useful standardized grading system for neurological status. Here is a chart illustrating its components and relative points. GCS grades may be broken down into mild trauma, 13 to 15, moderate trauma, 9 to 12, 
and severe trauma, three to eight. GCS of eight or less is considered coma. Putting it all together, it is important to combine clinical clues with radiographic findings and physical exam. In addition, serial assessment is critical to detecting progression and deterioration in this patient population. Final pearls, learn it all, divide it up with focused exams based upon a patient's presentation, never skip the important features, and be sure to document findings well.